Okay, hello. Shall we uh, go ahead and start? I'm, uh, I'm very pleasantly surprised to see, but you're making me nervous because there's so many of you. But <laughs> see such a crowd because uh, through a total error, my own error, we scheduled this at the same time as David Lewis's class. And I go to his class that meets on Monday, but this, I guess there's a class that meets right now. So we're, for those of you who are missing it, uh, you honor us by being here. And for those who may have gone to David Lewis's class, we're attempting to make a recording because I think some of this information will be valuable. Now, we had thought there would be three speakers today, and uh, where, where's Mary? Mary, where are you? Right here. Oh, okay, there she is, okay. Yeah, right and Mary is here representing Dr. Ray, who was going to speak. However, Mary prefer, so I'm going to read his yeah. remarks. Be doctor, you be doctor. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll be a doctor. Yeah, if you, okay, so if you have broken bones or whatever, you can come to me, I'll take care of them. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the first speaker is going to be in conjunction uh, or inspired by Sal de Blasi, but uh, Valerie has agreed to talk on that on the uh, topic of this LIFT program. This year, transportation to doctor appointments became a topic of discussion, and we thought it would be useful for people to know about this government program. So she's going to. Uh, talk about about that, and uh, she couldn't get out of it because she didn't know how to say no to me. So here's, <laughs> here's <what I'll> do. <laughs> okay. Um, now, before I start, I want to uh, circulate some information that you can be looking at while I'm talking. First is this writer's guide for the breeze, and the second thing is the paratransit application form. And I'm circulating it so you can take a look at it. There you go. OK, now we're talking about the lift, which is a service that is being provided by the North County Transit District. The local um, nickname for it really is the lift. Um, the official official name is ADA Tran Paratransit. Uh, it's something which is available in many parts of the country. The paratransit part means that it's an auxiliary or a side-by-side -side transportation system. Um, and as you will see from what I'm passing around, the transportation system we have here in North County is really very extensive. There are buses that link to other buses, and if you have the time, you can pretty much get over North County by the bus. Um, the other part of the definition is ADA, which stands for Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. And that has a lot of things in it, but the thing that we're most interested in today is the requirement that public fixed route transportation must be accessible to persons with disabilities. Now, a lot of work has been um, put into fulfilling this requirement already on the regular bus systems. You probably know that the buses are generally equipped with the ability to kneel down so that they're more on the level of the sidewalk. In addition, um, they have ramps that can be put on so that people in wheelchairs, for instance, can ride right up into the bus. Uh, once on the bus, the front seats are um, given, give priority to the elderly or the disabled. And if you get on the bus and you need to have one of the front seats, the bus driver will move an able-bodied person away so that you can sit in the front. In addition, some of those seats can be raised and so room can be made for a wheelchair and the bus driver can tie down the wheelchair so you can sit in it and not roll around the bus while the bus is moving. In spite of all of these modifications, there are certainly are still some disabilities which render a person unable to take the public transportation. And that's where the lift comes in. 
Um, the features of the lift are that it's curb to curb. You have to get outside of your house onto the sidewalk in front of your house. From there, the, the lift can pick you up and take you to the sidewalk of your address, whatever that is. Um, and if needed, you can take a personal care attendant with you. Um, the lift runs on the same days of the week and the same general times as the regular transportation <laughs> system. And it goes to the same general places, which is one reason I'm passing the bus route around. But they're really quite generous in that they are allowing three quarters of a mile away from a fixed route. Um, fixed route. Uh, and you can still use the lift. So if you look at the network and you consider three quarters of a mile on either side of all routes, you really can get around where it is you, you wish to go. Um, the service covers Carlsbad, Vista, Encinitas, Oceanside, a lot of adjoining cities and unincorporated areas. And you can transfer, if you need to, to the San Diego or to the Orange County transit systems. So this really unlocks a lot for people. The fare is $4 one way, and you can make reservations one to two business days in advance. Now I just want to say a couple words about what the paratransit is not. It's not a complete transportation service. In other words, I'm sure you can all think of places and times of the day that you would like to go to, like up onto a mountain to watch the sunrise. Uh, paratransit not, is not going to do that for you. No romantic weekends. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe. Um, it's not medical transportation. In other words, it's not an ambulance. There's not going to be anybody on board to take care of you while you're there. It's only for people who cannot use the regular transit system, which implies an eligibility requirement, and we'll get to that in just a minute. And someone was asking me if there's an income dependence. The answer is no. It, you don't have to be very poor in order to ride it. This is for disability. It's not, it's not based on income. Now, in terms of eligibility, you'll have to fill out an application. Applications are available on the internet um, or at a transit office, transit district office. Um, if you, there's also a, an application for a medical person to confirm whatever your medical uh, condition is, but it sounds like from the list of people that they're fairly liberal about what kind of medical person you need. And I don't think that that should be an impediment to anybody. Uh, the application, once it's filled in, has to be mailed or hand-delivered to a transit district office. In some circumstances, they may require a face-to-face -face interview. I don't know what those circumstances are, but that's something that they may require. Um, you should be informed of the decision within 21 days of the receipt of your application. Now, I'm not clear what the criteria are. They're spelled out in the ADA, and uh, they didn't spell it out to me. But they are based on the applicant's functional ability to use the bus. And the general types of questions they asked are, are you unable to travel independently? Are you unable to ride in a lift-equipped bus? Or are you unable to get to and from the bus? So if the answer to one or more of these questions is yes, you have a good likelihood of being accepted. It's not a medical decision, but you need to give information about your impairments and particularly you need to explain how it is that your impairments prevent you from using the regular bus. Uh, we have contact information. The nearest office is on Mission Avenue and Oceanside got a phone number and the web address. And in addition, we have Sal de Blasi with us. <laughs> Sal has taken the lift all the way to La Jolla for a medical treatment. And he's agreed to answer questions about his personal experience. I've prepared some fact sheets 
which if there are still some left there in the back, if you didn't get one and you feel that you need to know how to get in touch with the lift, I can get you a copy. So are there any questions that anybody has for me or for Sal about the lift? Yes, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a plan. I mean, I didn't plan to question. Do you have to take the lift to a bus, transfer to a bus, and then transfer back to lift to get to your appointment? Um, if you can't, if you're taking the lift because you can't ride on the bus, maybe, um, I mean, there are some interesting questions like, can you make change with the bus driver? And if you can't do that, or if you really can't see, so you don't know when your station comes, or if your mind isn't up to traveling by yourself or something, that no, you, they can't put you on the bus because you were certified as not able to ride the bus. So it is door to door. Yeah, curb to curb. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, well, read the information that's going around and uh, let me know if you have questions later. Sal is our, our resident expert. Uh, and uh, Sal, you know, when he, you all know that Sal had an eye operation recently. We, I think we saw that and now he's here and he's, he's looking at me. So I realize he can actually see me, so that's a kind of a miracle, but he took the lift from here all the way to the Shiloh Ice, Shiloh. Shiloh Ice Center at uh, La Jolla Torrey Pines. So uh, it will take you quite a distance for the four dollars and it's a, a, a van somewhat like our senior our van here, isn't that right so? Yes. So. Well, new topic. How many of you have long-term care insurance? Quite a few. Quite a few. Uh, pardon? When you say, uh, would you explain about these long-term insurance? Yeah, I have an insurance, but I don't know. Okay. Um, I don't know whether they have it in Italy or not, but anyway, long-term care insurance uh, provides, if you reach a point where you're unable to care for yourself and you need assistance with two or more functions, and we'll go into that in a minute, this provides a benefit to help pay for the care that you might then need. Kind of insurance that's uh, come into being in recent years and uh, it's been evolving, and we're going to talk today about an evolution. But maybe it'll become clearer to you if I say that uh, here at Carlsbad by the Sea, we have what's known as a type B contract. That means that if we go to the care center, we pay a discounted rate, but we pay a fee for each of the services that are provided in the care center and for certain other services. Uh, other communities have what's known as a type A contract, which includes those, the, those services. And the difference between the type A and the type B contract is long-term care insurance. That's what the gap that long-term care insurance seeks to meet. So in effect, the type A contract includes long-term care insurance. That can be worth a considerable amount. The value of that for a person age 65 is about $600 a month. And that rises at age 85 to $2,400 a month. And by age 95, you're up to $6,000 a month in the value of that coverage. That's what it costs to get long-term care covered, if you can find it, at those uh, different areas. Now, how many of you who have long-term care know whether you have a state of California recognized partnership contract? Wally does. I have it with CalPERS. Yes, okay. That's uh, very good. And how many of you know what it is to have a state of California recognized partnership contract? Good then you come to the right place, <laughs> as I'm here to tell you. In brief, partnership long-term care insurance contracts 
let you protect your assets to the extent of any benefits that you receive under the policies. Ordinarily, Medicaid, which is known in California cleverly as Medi-Cal, pays for nursing care once your assets are reduced to a minimum of $2,000. So before you can receive the government Medi-Cal benefits, you have to spend down all of your assets except for $2,000. If you have other assets, you know, for example, people are allowed to keep a home if they're living in their home. After your death, Medi-Cal can and will claim part or all of that estate to recover any benefits that Medi-Cal has paid for your care. Partnership long-term care policies change that. And I want to tell you a tale. This is a story. It's a little awkward. I found it. I, was, I tried out uh, the, reading this story today to see how it flowed. But the story is taken directly from the state of California's Department of Health Care Services, which is the government agency that oversees these partnership plans. And I wanted to keep their wording so I don't mess this up. So bear with me if it seems a little complex. I think it'll make sense in the end. This is the tale of Evelyn and Janet. Evelyn and Janet are both healthy 65-year-old Californians. They both have $150,000 of assets in the bank and they each own a home which is free and clear. They have the same amount of money budgeted to spend for long-term care insurance. They both buy long-term care insurance policies with two years of coverage at $210 a day. And that gives them $153,000 with inflation protection. Evelyn buys a partnership policy while Janet buys a non-partnership policy, and both are available. So if you don't know whether your policy is a partnership policy or not, this is something you're going to want to try to find out. Janet and Evelyn pay the same premiums. They receive the same amount of long-term care, but because Janet has an older policy, her assets are not protected. 20 years later, Evelyn and Janet both require long-term care, and begin to draw their insurance benefits. During that 20 years, the price of long-term care services has increased to over $200,000 a year. Their private insurance coverage runs out after the two years and after they've received $400,000 in benefits. The $400,000 is the $200,000 for each of the two years that they received under their policies. Up to this point, their long-term care costs and benefits have been identical. With their insurance benefits exhausted, they turn to have Medi-Cal, the government, to help pay for the additional long-term care they need. Because Evelyn's partnership policy paid the $400,000 plus toward her care, she is allowed to keep the $400,000 in assets plus the $2,000 allowance. So she is able to preserve $402,000 of assets because she has a partnership policy. Sadly, since Janet did not buy a partnership policy and Medi-Cal required her to spend almost all of her assets other than the $2,000, uh, she is required to repay Medi-Cal for the benefit that was paid. So both are required to spend almost all their income towards their care before Medi-Cal will pay both were allowed to keep their homes. They both received the long-term care for the remainder of their lives. But to recover the cost of the care it paid, Medi-Cal claims a, files a claim against Janet's estate, which is her home and some other assets she had protected, and recovers $175,000, which in the state's example is the amount that Medi-Cal paid for her care. Evelyn's home is also worth $200,000, and she has another $150,000 in savings, which is protected because she received over $400,000 in asset protection from the benefits paid by her partnership policy. Medi-Cal places no claim against Evelyn's estate, allowing Evelyn to leave her home and savings to her heirs. So 
They both pay the same premiums. They don't get the same result. And there's more to it. Let me tell you which companies offer it. Bankers Life and Casualty, Genworth Financial, John Hancock Life Insurance Company, MetLife, New York Life Insurance, and CalPERS, as uh, Wally mentioned. So if you're covered with one of those companies, you want to ask whether your policy is a partnership policy or not a partnership policy. Uh, the agent should be able to tell you. And if it isn't, you probably want to change because this is not something that's priced in the insurance. This is provided by as a provision of the Medi-Cal law. So this is just a legal provision. And if you have the right po qualifying policy, then you get this additional benefit. There are, and if you don't have one of the policy from one of those companies, then your policy is, does not qualify and you may want to reconsider. There are other benefits as well. The state requires that partnership policies have substance to them. They can't just sell you smoke and mirrors. And that means that all policies provide a minimum daily benefit that's set by the state and it's considered to be minimally sufficient to help you. All policies have built-in inflation protection. All policies have to use the newer, more liberal uh, activities of daily living tests. And for those who aren't familiar with this expression, activities of daily living, uh, it's eating, toileting, transferring, bathing, dressing, and continence. So uh, they, that's a more liberal definition than what some of the older long-term care insurance policies include. Cognitive impairment also qualifies for benefits. All of the partnership policies have built-in care management benefits, which can be helpful if you need a caregiver. All policies include waiver of premium, so you don't inadvertently lose your coverage if you are in a facility and lose track of your financial affairs. I hate to say it, but that occurred, the industry is not above letting people lose their coverage just because they're losing their marbles a little bit and they don't pay the premium. And all policies are required to include residential care facility coverage, and Carlsbad by the Sea is licensed as a residential care facility. So that means that anybody living here who has one of these partnership policies has coverage for the services that are provided here, including the services in your apartment. There's a, a, a brief fact sheet in the back of the room, if you'd like a copy, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Let's start with Judge. Jim got his hand up My slightly before you. Long-term carriage. Pardon? My wife and I have long-term carriage. It was issued in Illinois. Is it a California partnership? It is not. The Cal California California loves to be unique, as you know. <laughs> they always go their own way. And uh, the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005 opened these partnership plans to people in all states and allowed for portability of coverage across state lines. Calif but the states have to adopt something under the, that law. I forget exactly what it is they have to adopt. California has elected not to do that so far. And so California, we get a, I have a partnership plan in the state of California, which would affect California's Medi-Cal costs. It has to be a California contract, and you have to be a California, I think the criteria on that fact should be a California resident. Yeah. Mary Beth? If you have long-term care insurance, which like Jim is purchased out of state, and you've moved to California, is it possible to talk to the insurance company and see if you can get a change? I, uh, that crossed my mind, and I, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know uh, why it would. It depends on how California has adopted its regulation. If they're requiring that it had been a California contract from issue, you might have to give up one contract and take a new take contract. Premium, but but it's hour possible hour. that they would the company would allow you, I'd certainly start with your own existing carrier, because they might allow you some credit. And uh, uh, as Jim knows, because he's from insurance, these are called change rules, and they can get very complex. You don't know if you can amend your policy, your current policy. 
Well, you can always amend it if the other guy agrees. But, <laughs> but uh, the insurance company amended it. You're right. But whether it would then qualify for this partnership protection, which I think for most of us could be very valuable because it provides asset protection. We don't have, you know, we could, that's something that many of us could actually use. They may say, I'm sorry, we can't do it, but you can buy a new one. Yeah. That increases your premium. Well, then sometimes you have to be careful who you ask for the information because sometimes the people you ask may have a... Uh... Well, here you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you, you've got that. Any more questions on that? The fact sheet, I mean, this is just something you want to be aware of and really look into. That's really interesting. I thought it was very interesting and there was a great deal of discussion of this at the actuarial meeting that I went to recently, Mary Beth, and um, the companies are concerned because their sales dropped tremendously, and now they're beginning to come back with these new, new plans. Uh, and what happened was that people were not buying long-term care insurance, because why buy long-term care insurance when you have to give up all your assets anyway to get the government benefit and people saw all that long-term care insurance did was to delay their getting their government benefit. So the, the um, idea here is that the government saw that their position on that was counterproductive. So they're trying to work to make it so people are encouraged to provide for themselves uh, and not just rely on the government. Now, let's see, I've got to make a transition here. So I'm putting on a, a white doctor smock, <laughs> a virtual smock. Mary, you're sure you don't want to read it? I offered Mary the chance to read it. So, so I, I talked to uh, Dr. Ray shortly before the meeting, and uh, he's not feeling too well today and didn't want to risk uh, going out in public. But his remarks, and I haven't seen these. I just got these. So I'll be seeing them for the first time as I read them with you. Uh, this relates to Assembly Bill 1022, and uh, which is sometimes called the Continuing Care Retirement Community Without Walls Bill. <coughs> uh, resident, it's, the title here that he has is Residential Care Activities for the Elderly, amended once in 2007, twice in 2008. When it's amended, that just means the bill has been amended. This is not yet a law. This is something that certain people would like to have be a law. And these are uh, Dr. Ray's words. In my opinion, this bill contains two parts, a care at home program and a section dealing with the relationships between continuing care retirement community residents and the governing administration of the provider companies. It is sponsored and promoted by Aging Services of California, which is an organization originated and supported by the provider companies in the retirement home business. It purports to represent all the retirement communities' residents, but in fact has no representation on its governing board. CALCRA and uh, over here, somebody was asking me, what do these acronyms mean? CALCRA, the California Continuing Care Residents Association, is the only entity that can express the resident viewpoint for us, and that is why we are here today. The Care at Home program is essentially a housekeeping program for the elderly in their own homes, an extension of some of the functions of an independent home health agency or of the assisted living portion of a three-tiered retirement community, mobile retirees, assisted living, and skilled nursing care units. The program promises to deliver meal preparation, housekeeping, laundry, home and grounds maintenance, companionship, and social and recreational activities. The critical feature to be offered is the continuing care at home program an extension of the medical aspect of assisted living delivered to the retiree in their own home. This would include personal hygiene, medication administration and management, ancillary services such as physical and occupational therapy, 
social worker consultation, etc., etc. In other words, all the services now available in-house would be delivered in the home. By in-house, I think he means that we could get here. Of course, there would be a fee involved with the contract not to exceed $10,000 in any one year. AB 1022 exempts a care at home program from the licensing provisions applicable to residential care facilities for the elderly. The provider of continuing care communities who hold this contract will not be required to have the same fiscal reserves as a continuing care provider. You can readily see the hand of the provider group at work in the construction of this bill. Should the retiree at home require in-house care in assisted living or skilled nursing, the contract permits the provider to bring them in. However, the provider must give continuing care retirement community residents priority over continuing care at home residents when the need arises. I'm not sure that that's right, but maybe you can, because I thought that they just had to give them the same priority. But then he has a caption disclosure. The provider must publish the revenue and expense details of the care at home program and the financial impact on the resident community by using the facilities assisted living and skilled care assets as it affects the community's overall financial health. In other words, does this new program use the residents' fees or maintenance money to support outside retirees' benefits under this new bill? And who will speak for us when the decision is made, if not CalCo? Here are some excerpts from the bill. The provider shall hold semi-annual meetings for the residents. The provider shall permit residents attending to present issues orally or in writing. There will be free discussion of income expenditures, financial trends and issues, and proposed changes in policies, programs, and services. The provider will discuss any increase in the monthly maintenance fee 30 days in advance and will provide the basis for determining the amount of the increase and the data used for calculating the increase. If the provider operates a continuing care at home program, he, or presumably he or she, <laughs> must make available a financial statement of activity showing revenue and expense details and the impact on the community's finances and reserves. There shall be at least one non-voting member of the provider's governing board from each community. The provider shall provide notice of the meeting, board packets, minutes, etc., to the board representative. That person shall be permitted to attend, speak, and participate in all meetings of the board. The governing board may exclude the member from executive meetings, but must be included in executive sessions related to discussions of the annual budgets, increases in monthly care fees, indebtedness, and expansion of new and existing continuing care retirement communities. Now, he, this is now an excerpt from the top the newsletter that he asked that I share with you. It is probable we will pursue, the we being Calgary, it is probable we will pursue legislation next year to require any continuing care retirement community that undertakes a care at home venture for non-residents to fund this in a corporate entity separate from the continuing care retirement community and the current residents must be fully protected from any added costs and overcrowding of already established services, most especially higher levels of care. And I know from talking with Dr. Ray that he's very concerned that when we need care, that the, the availability of that care be there for us in the care center and that we maintain the very high standard that we have in our care center. He concludes, if we wish to have a voice in the determination of these things, then we must band together to empower that voice. Alone, we can do very little. Together in Calcra, we may be able to influence our future. Now, are there any questions on that? <laughs> not sure that even I can think of a question. Oh, we got a question. Okay. Oh, I have a question. We have a policy, but I'm not sure that when you're in a home that it covers the medical attention by a doctor. You mean you have a long term care? Yes, he was making that point. Well, you know, long-term care insurance wouldn't cover the, your, the 
doctor coming to visit you in the home, that would be covered under your regular medical insurance. So, uh, you know, what Medicare would provide for that directly. Is there anything else? Mary Beth, this is a wonderful segue since Ray focused a lot on Calpra and his remarks. So Mary Beth is going to talk to us about uh, Calpra. And most of it was about how you join, how you buy a contract, what the contract had to include, and that sort of thing. But there were no, um, many, there weren't many provisions on how residents would be treated and what those kinds of things would be, because it was based on the philosophy that the res retirement communities were built to take care of the people, and um, it was a real change. When I, um, some of you know that my husband and I lived at Hawaii Village Towers before we came here, and I was the first president of their resident association. And when I <clears throat> became president, I got a copy of the current law, and this was now 12 years ago. And I looked at it, and it, it wasn't very long. And so it was easy to know what kinds of provisions there were regarding the residents. When we moved here, and there was an occasion when somebody asked me if I knew what the law was, and I had given all my papers when we left Ohio Village Towers to the people there, I didn't have any reference, so I started looking in the internet to find the current law. And when I got it, I was absolutely astounded because there were so many more law regarding the residents than there, than there had been previously what was about two pages became about seven pages. And my sense of, from my previous experience was there has to be some organization that's done some work with the legislature regarding this or there would not be all of these provisions. And that led me to find out what organization that was. And in checking, I discovered about CalCRO. And about that time, when Wally Cohen was president, uh, he got a letter from uh, Calcra saying that uh, their president would be in the area and could she come and speak to our residents. And so Wally arranged for her to come and speak to us. And we learned about Calcra in a formal way. Calcra was formed by this couple and it grew in primarily Northern California because they were in the Northern California area, in the Bay Area. And other residents from other retirement communities joined with them. And they have accomplished a great deal in 10 years. They um, require, the legislation that they have been able to get passed is really astounding. And these things were not there before their effort. 
They require similar annual meetings of providers with the residents. Require a 30-day notice and a meeting with the residents before increasing monthly dues. Give residents access to documents filed by providers with the Department of Social Services. And the Department of Social Services continuing contracts division are the ones that supervise and oversee the communities like ours. Give residents access to resident satisfaction surveys by pro providers and any DSS citations in, uh, issued to the provider. Then they, there are a number of provisions in the law which promote resident participation. Eight, uh, add to resident bill of rights in assisting the law to, by, to organize resident association and permit residents to speak at resident management meetings. Require each continuing care re uh, retirement community to have at least one non-voting resident representative to the provider board of directors and that in our case is our president of our association. For multi-facility <coughs> providers, at least one resident for each of three facilities and our front porch has every president of every one of the retirement communities goes to the board meetings. Residents have the right to elect resident representatives to provider boards and Front Porch has chosen to interpret that, that that will be a de facto the president of, of the resident association. Um, provide to each resident representative the same notice board packet as the board members receive. Provide the resident representatives may attend board finance committee meetings. And just as an aside, there is not, Front Porch does not have a separate finance meeting per se, and so they treat the board of directors meeting as, quote, the finance committee. So there isn't any additional representation from um, our community to their board in regard to that. Permit resident representative to attend, speak, and participate at all board meetings, which is permissible at our board. Require all resident advisory committee members to be residents of continuing care facilities. Um, I don't know how, uh, to my knowledge, our porch, at least when I was president, didn't have any, quote, advisory committee, so I don't know if that is a provision that's ever done. Then they have some unfinancial disclosure. Providers must make available no less than semi-annually to the resident council or a committee of the residents a financial statement of activities comparing actual costs to budgeted costs broken down by expense category and consult with the resident council or members of the residents during the annual budgeting process. And in this facility, in my experience, the part of the consultation has been done primarily for the capital budget, um, not the operating budget. And we do have in the library every six months a, a very sketchy list of the expenses and um, of the budgets for those. Providers must post a copy of the annual report submitted to the DSS at a central conspicuous location. And that is in the library. It's a bound with a spiral down and it says the Department of uh, Social Services. Um, all of a sudden I can't think of the word. Uh, reserve report, thank you. And, uh, and that does give a much more detailed report than you can see in the audit uh, because the audit is purely Financial, and this has much more about the number of residents for each community that is a continuing care within Front Port. Provide resident representative access to board executive sessions related to budgets, fees, for expansion, and debt. When I was president, I don't know, is Wally here? Um, I don't know whether Wally has changed with us since Wally's been president of the four years I was president. Uh, we were never allowed to meet in the executive session uh, because theoretically uh, they didn't 
discuss budget fees, expansion debt in their executive session. But I can't believe that they never discussed them because by the time we came to the board, it was pretty cut and dry. <laughs> Um, Multi-facility providers must break down financial statements by facility and that the only place they do that that we have access to is in that reserve report. Clarify the information provided to residents with notices of fee increases for monthly care. Protection of resident rights in cases of liquidation or receivership of providers. Providers must file with the DSS an annual financial report disclosing key financial ratios and other key indicators. Every five years, life care facilities must obtain an actuary's opinion as to the provider's actuary financial condition. And that does not cover us because that actually are the type A contracts that Jack referred to, and we are type B. We've only had one actuarial um, study that I know of, which was required for all of ones, one year, and then that's been the only basis that we've had. Expand from 45 to 75 days the amount of operating expenses providers must hold in liquid reserve. All of these are provisions that are in the law that have come about by office efforts. Require DSS to respond to resident complaints within 15 days, which means any resident can write or call the DSS and ask about something or inquire about something. Require DSS to summarize resident complaints for the advisory committee. And the advisory committee is the committee that I serve on as an individual, not because I was president of the association at the time I was appointed because it was before then. And we meet um, three or four times a year um, to look at the information that the DSS receives and then uh, try to advise them on it. We have no legislative ability or anything to where we can tell them what to do. We merely advise them. Uh, require the provider to file a disaster preparedness plan with DSS. Provide an appeal process to the provider's authority to transfer residents to a higher level of care. And this was the la latest uh, legislative effort on the part of CalCRA because they were finding that in some communities there seemed to be some very arbitrary transfer of residents from their residents, and I feel that we have not had that happen here, to um, their care center. And then so that they had the availability of reselling those apartments. And then the resident was either responsible for that care at their own expense or based on their long-term policy or Medicare or whatever it was. Um, anyone who is a resident of any continuing care uh, retirement community can join CalCRA. The dues are $18 a year. Their budget is fairly small. They basically, everybody gives their time. They have begun to slightly reimburse on some of the cost of travel as travel has become more expensive. But um, the operating budget is only $25,000. And that's compared to the operating budget of, uh, of the aging services, which is uh, like, they, they spend over $200,000 alone on just their of monitoring of the legislation and uh, working against any new legislation. Uh, the biggest expense, 18000 is to retain a part-time lobbyist who is a man who has been working mostly pro bono for the association. He's retiring, unfortunately, so that we're going to lose him. And he's been very effective in working with um, the various uh, legislatures to have their support and be willing to pass this. Um, my understanding is that CalCRA is experiencing more resistance on the part of Front Porch itself and other providers, and they have hired much more skilled uh, people to fight the things that CalCRA are doing. So I think it's important that CalCRA have more members so they can say we speak for more of the residents um, when they go to the legislature. So if any of you are empathetic with what I've suggested, 
and you're not members currently, I think it would be to our all benefit for everyone to be a member of CalCRA. And as a member, you get the newsletter. And Jack has some on the back. I don't know if any of you have seen it. So anybody who is a member already has gotten one of these in the mail. And if you've gotten one and you've picked one up, put it back there so the non-members can be able to get it. But if you have an internet connection, you can go on the CalCRA news um, internet site and get your own newsletter, whether you're a member or not, and that's what it looks like. And it comes off, if you have a color printer, it comes off like this. And there are some interesting articles in here about what CalCRA does and what some other communities are doing. Um, I've given you a lot of detail and it's sort of mind-boggling, I know. But this is the kind of thing that means that we do have, somebody has to do the work in order to protect us as residents. Because the natural inclination, if you are a provider, is to think you're doing everything wonderful and not be aware of how the residents feel unless you ask them. And how often they're asked makes a big difference in the communities. There are some communities where there's very good communication two ways, and there's others where it isn't that effective. I'd be glad to answer any questions regarding the opera if you'd like. Yes, Norma? Is there a lesser amount to join Calpro for a couple where it's the table members? No, it's thirty-five dollars for a couple. So you get a bargain because they only have to send one newsletter. <laughs> and um, it's I, I have come to have a great deal of respect for the work that's done by these volunteers. And I'm hoping that um, we can increase our membership in all the rest of the retirement communities because I think that's our only voice that we ever have at this time. Anybody else? <laughs> Uh, Mike? Is there, uh, I believe you said the budget for CalCRA in the year is $25,000? Um, $26,000. Yeah. And you, on the other side of the ledger, can you say how much the front porch has spent for legal and lobbying? And so According to the audit that I can figure out, it's about 100000 just front porch alone. And then uh, Aging Services spends about 200000 They have three people who work with the legislature from Aging Services. It's pretty lopsided. <laughs> it's, um, you know. Yes, Ann? Well, who does Aging Services represent? The res well, let me, it, it's an organization of the providers. They pay dues, which are very substantial, out of their own budgets, which of course most of them, most of their income comes from our monthly fees. And then they have made an interesting decision, um, change in their bylaws. They have said that all residents of all continuing care communities are members of aging services. So they, even though it's controlled by and all the board members come from the provider group, they say, we speak for all the residents in California who are living in retirement communities. It's very interesting. And we get a newsletter every month uh, which comes to Wally, uh, it comes to the president of the council, and I don't know if it's on the a table. I always put them on the table each time I got one, and it's their monthly. It's a very nicely, beautifully done little magazine sort of thing that's there, and it's got information about what they're working on. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Beth. It's Mary Beth has a lot of background with uh, with all of this, and I'm always sort of in awe at her ability to recall uh, the players and how it all works. And, but I, you know, one, not but, but a, an observation. Uh, I've been active now for 
a year or so on the legislative committee and I've attended many of the meetings also of the finance committee. And I'd like to say that everybody would really like to be working together in partnership with the provider. Front Porch's success is our success. We want this place to thrive. We want the care to be there uh, when we need it. We want it to be first class care. We want that very much. And uh, the employees here are very, very dedicated and really devote themselves to us and in every possible way. It's not clear to me 100% why it's so hard for us to communicate with the corporate office. There's been some history in the past that some of you may recall and I've heard about and uh, it makes uh, for interesting tales. But I think it's very unfortunate that things have come now to the state where we're only allowed to submit questions in writing, but they don't reply in writing, they reply only orally. And they counter that they're not permitted to do this because of the covenants for the bonds which they've used to finance properties like this. And that may be the case. On another tangent, Aging Services, as Mary Beth pointed out, has now extended its umbrella to be not just providers, but all residents. And welcome to membership in Aging Services, because all of you are now members of Aging Services of California. I think they forgot to send you their newsletter, but you're all members, and I think you should feel good about that. And Ann Burns Johnson, who's the CEO of Aging Services, has indicated that they've reached out the hand of friendship to the residents, and I'm inclined to take it on and flood them, because I think there's more of us than there is of them, and I think our interests are parallel. I don't think there's a conflict between the interests of residents and the interests of providers. Ah. We just need to help them to understand. Well, I, I understand what you're saying, Vic, and sometimes uh, some people may feel that they're entitled to more salary than what they might deserve, and that's a challenge and that's between them and their God, and I have difficulty with that. But I think in the long term, their interest is to keep their costs down. That salary should not be there, and uh, it's not in their interest to be paying that kind of money for that sort of thing. So with that, blessings on you all. Does anybody have any words of wisdom they want to share, or do you want to go off and try to catch up with David Lewis? And Tell them how they join Cal. If you're not already members, you, uh, I guess you have to give me your name and address and your money. 34% mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of our residents are members of Calvary. 34%. That's virtually the same percentage as the percentage of residents at the Covington, uh, where I just recently heard the percentage. So we're pretty much in line with what other communities are doing. It's unfortunate that it's only a third of our residents, but you know, that's the way it is, and it'd be wonderful if we could get it higher. Thank you all for coming, and for those who missed it, there is a recording.